His was the only boat to arrive. I think maybe it was a cow. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> There's a thank you letter from Lyndon Johnson. There was even a monorail at one point to the east of us. Plus, everybody forgets about pirates. This is the coolest field trip I have ever been on. I don't know, but I've been told keep on dance for never get old. Hello and welcome to the Long Island History Project, the podcast that brings you stories and interviews with people passionate about Long Island history. You can hear them all at longislandhistoryproject.org. My name is Chris Kretz, I am your host, and our opening music was courtesy of the Homegrown String Band. Today we're taking a walk through time and nature in the wild heart of Nassau County, with today's very special guest. Hi, I'm Betsy Galata. I'm the former conservation project manager of Friends of Hempstead Plains at Nassau Community College. We're a nonprofit environmental organization dedicated to the preservation of the last remaining pieces of the Hempstead Plains on Long Island. And Betsy, first of all, thanks for having us in today. Do you want to explain geographically where we are right now, this location? We are basically right in the middle of Nassau County. Um, we, ha we are surrounded by uh, the Coliseum, the Nassau County Coliseum, a Marriott Hotel. We are on the campus of Nassau Community College, which is um, on the site of the old Mitchell Field Air Force Base. Okay, and you're going to take us on tour. We're going to walk out. So we're kind of in a structure here. This is sort of your... your Welcome Center, what would you, how would you describe this building? Yeah, this is what we call our Hempstead Plains Education and Research Center. It's an uh, environmentally sensitive building that is constructed of four uh, shipping containers that have been refitted to make a classroom size building so that we can bring students and, and other interested community uh, people to see what we have um, here at the Hempstead Plains. And I was, uh, I was looking at the Google Earth view. It, do you have plantings on the roof of this? Yes, there's a, a um, garden roof, uh, what we call a green roof, and it's planted with the native Hempstead Plains grasses, and et cetera, and the uh, seeds blow in, so we get all sorts of different plants from the Hempstead Plains up there. Okay, so why don't you walk us out? We, we do a lot of um, talks with people about historical preservation, and we've done a few where, like we talked about preserving Lake Ronkonkoma. Mm -hmm. So, you know, th this idea of, of preserving nature is fascinating. It's not maybe what people think of in terms of preservation usually, but. Just be careful, you gotta walk down here. Okay. So how, how big is this site that we're walking in? So the site that we're on now is uh, between 17 and 19 acres. It's the last remnant of the true uh, Hempstead Plains Prairie that is that we have here at Nassau Community College. Um, it used to be, a long time ago, over, over 40,000 acres uh, in this region, and, and it was a true prairie. It's the only true prairie east of the um, Appalachian Mountains. Is there a, an, an official definition of a prairie? That we, that we should know? Well, yes, a prairie is a specialized ecological system, um, kind of like a forest or a pine barrens or a salt marsh. It's a special type of ecological um, community that's covered mostly with specific kinds of grasses and some specific kinds of wildflowers. So this track that we're on has never been built on, has never been uh, developed? Well, we don't know that for sure because the history of the area from uh, the 1600s talk about the, uh, the sheep grazing that used to go on here. This was a big sheep grazing area that was um, owned by the town of Hempstead and it was held in commons for the farmers to graze their sheep. Uh, there's probably cattle grazing here. Uh, some of it was probably farmed. There's um, some construction all around us as you can see and the um, trees and shrubs have grown up over most of the prairie uh, not including this one parcel which which seems to have been uh, retained in its fairly original condition because it was under the um, protection of the Mitchell Field Air Force Base from the 1900s to 1961. It was completely fenced in about uh, 2,000 acres and so it was protected uh, in that way. So sort of inadvertently and I was reading, we'll put some resources on the web page, but I was reading a 
fairly recent article where they mentioned that there's some of the rough in the Eisenhower golf course is potentially un, you know, the same type of protected swath of the plains. Yes, there are some fragments around the golf course and, and even in other um, areas. Uh, one of the high schools, the uh, Wheatley High School, has some Hempstead Plains uh, on its campus. And around other areas, we, we find that there are a few little fragments left. But this is the only truly protected area that we have here. Uh, there's also another parcel across the street from us called the Fran Purcell Preserve, um, which is a large preserve containing about 26 more acres of Hempstead Plains. And our organization, Friends of Hempstead Plains, is currently managing that too and trying to restore it to its native condition. Okay, so let, let's take a walk around. We'll just mention it's, um, the growth is about what you say, uh, knee high. Yeah, the grasses normally grow to be about four, sometimes five feet tall in the fall. This summer has been a brutally hot and dry summer, so we don't see as much full growth of the grasses as you would in a normal uh, September. Um, some of the grasses look like they're dying, and it's basically due to the uh, tremendous heat that we've had for the summer. And so you've got a, a path that, that winds through this property. Is that... Do you, do you worry about people going off the path? Like what's, what's the trade-off between having people walk in here and, and preserving it? Well, we prefer that when people come, especially if it's a class or you know, a lot of people together, that they stay on the path. But when we're doing research or looking at something specific, we have no problem with people going off the path. You just have to watch out for ticks. No, it, it's very peaceful. I mean, we, we can probably hear in the background a little of some planes and some traffic, but it, you do get a feeling of being in, a, in an oasis here in the middle of Nassau County. Yeah, it's true. And the, the little trails that we have marked off here have, have been mowed um, for people who want to walk um, either a short quarter mile trail loop around, or if you want to go a longer trail, which is about a mile, you can loop around the entire area. So what, what kind of um, wildlife do you have either using this or passing through here? Well, we're mostly interested in the native plants that are here, but as far as the other kind of wildlife we have, we have a lot of insects that people are interested in, especially the pollinators, the bees and the flies and the butterflies in particular. Um, we're trying to encourage the monarch butterfly because we have a lot of native milkweed that grows here, and that's um, the, the uh, specific plant that the uh, monarch butterflies need. Um, we have tons of rabbits and little mice and some shrews and um, lots of birds. Are you, are you a birder? Like, can you recognize birds? I am a birder and I could say that we, you might even see the red-tailed hawk flying around. That's one of our predators. Um, the kestrel, the American kestrel, is another one of our predators. Um, and then there are lots of songbirds, lots of sparrows, uh, mockingbirds, um, crows, blackbirds, red wing blackbirds, and so forth. So uh, do you want to mention um, how you came to be involved with this group? Well, I have been a professor at Nassau Community College for over 50 years. And back in um, the, it was right around the 1980s, um, this land was actually uh, saved uh, by the county and the organization, the Nature Conservancy, was very interested in protecting it because of a specific endangered species which grows here, which is very rare. It's called the Sand Plain Gerardia. Uh, and so the Nature Conservancy wanted to protect that species and so they developed a contract with the college to manage the area for about 10 or 15 years. And then around the end of the uh, 20th century, around 1999, 20, 2000, <laughs> um, the, they, the Nature Conservancy wasn't really interested in uh, working here anymore, and so I was retiring from my teaching position, and uh, we decided to form a nonprofit organization called Friends of Hempstead Plains so that we, uh, the faculty and some other interested community members could actually work and save the land and protect the, na the endangered species and the other native grasses that are here too. So if, if we stick for a minute with the, um, say, the undergraduate population, it, what have you noticed? Okay, go right here. Um, as you talk to students about the value of this land, like, do, do they get it? Do they become engaged? Or what do you have to do to make this sort of a topic that's of interest to them? 
Well, a lot of students and actually a lot of people in general have no idea what a what the Hempstead Plains is or even what a prairie is because it's so unusual in this part of the country. But once they come out here and they see the specific habitat that we have here and the importance of an endangered species, um, then, then they begin to realize that this is something that should be saved, especially in our busy, um, developed county that we have. And and just to go back to the the, the yeah, let's go in here. We'll see the okay yeah. sure see okay so now you are actually opening a gate for us. Is it this I I'm with you so this is okay right. Yeah, this is the fenced in area of where the endangered species live lives and we have it fenced in to, mostly to keep the rabbits out but also we're trying to encourage the um, sand plain gerardia to spread its seeds into a larger area because right now it seems to be confined to about a half a half an acre and um, over time we're interested in increasing the numbers of plants and and having it spread further out is, is there a natural limit given the size of, of the plot here how much how many different species can can survive in that space or do you have to worry about you know one one indigenous plant not growing too much faster than another or crowding out another well there's a difference between the native and the non-native plants in any community and the native plants here consist mostly of native grasses and these are tall grasses they're not like your lawn grass they're tall warm season grasses that have very very deep roots and as um, you can see they grow to be three four feet high um, there's about five or six kinds of those native grasses and then there's some native wildflowers too we have some white ones that we call bone set and we have some yellow ones that we call uh, different kinds of goldenrods and um, some orange ones that we call butterfly, milkweed, and several other kinds that um, come that bloom throughout the season. So those are the main native plants that we have. But then there's always an encroachment in any community. There's an encroachment of non-native plants wherever they can get hold, wherever they can take root. They will try to move in, and some of the non-native plants are more aggressive than the native ones, and so they tend to take hold. And those are the ones that we have to control. So we're going to walk through here so you can, uh, obviously, you can spot it. What, what, what does it look like at this point in the season? Well, this is past its blooming time. It uh, blooms in the end of August through the middle of September. So we might see uh, a couple of stragglers, but we actually, um, ha its peak seems to be right around Labor Day. And during that week, we have a, an organized count of volunteers, who of people who will come out here, and we systematically count every single plant that we can see when it's in full bloom. And we record that, so we have the records from 1984 all the way up through this year of how many plants actually um, are found in this plot. Well I, I guess one thing is do can you propagate it like in a greenhouse and then replant it out in the wild or is that's not the way you do it? That, that, that has actually been tried several times by researchers. Um, we've collected the seeds and uh, in the fall, and we've tried to germinate them and then uh, spread them or either spread the seeds themselves or spread the uh, seedlings that grow. Um, it has not been very successful in most areas. And so we're, we're moving into the fall season, or we're in the fall season, so it's kind of turning brown. What, as, as you've seen this change over the year, as, I guess this is not an entrance point. Well, it was. I don't know what happened to it. It okay. used to be an entrance point. I, I guess, could you visually describe um, how does this plot change through the season? Like, when, what, what colors do you see, or how does the, the vegetation change? Well, our prettiest season is in the fall, which is just beginning right okay, now, good. when it gets cooler and the grasses are at their tallest and the um, goldenrods are still blooming and, and there's a, a white flower that's blooming now called boneset um, and several other species that we could see in the fall. Um, and the colors of the leaves start changing, so the grasses' color leaves change also. And it's really very pretty in the fall. What's the level of, of visitors do you get? Is there like a, a surge at certain points or do you get field trips coming in students? 
during the school year, we uh, like right now, but because this is the nicest season here, we're, we're getting several different school classes that want to come uh, visit uh, just to tour, or in some cases, the college classes will come and they'll actually do some uh, research. And other cases, people will come and volunteer. Um, our volunteering consists mostly of removing the non-native plants that we don't want here, um, doing some mowing and things like that. Uh, so that the, 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 the best seasons for visiting are spring, summer, and fall. In the winter, everything kind of dies back, and um, the, our building is not heated, so we don't have too many activities going on in the winter. Okay. Um, this is an interesting plant here, this little one that's got the bluish tint to it. That's called wild indigo. Wild indigo has a beautiful yellow flower in the spring, and it turns dark blue, almost like indigo blue, in the fall. And the Native Americans used it to, to um, make their dyes. I, I was going to ask you that. So in, in terms of, you know, what's native, what's not native, obviously science can tell us. But are there records that, so you would know, like someone in the 1660s, did they record what was growing here? Or is, are there stray references that you could kind of corroborate what was growing back then? Yes, we have some records that go back to the 1800s, um, and one of the most interesting ones is a plant survey that was done by Henry Hicks, who his great-great-great-grandson, Stephen Hicks, is currently running the um, Hicks Nursery now, which is right up the street from here. So, it, and we'll talk more about the history, but it, it was a notable, I don't, I don't know if you'd say it's a tourist attraction, but it was a land, landmark, a feature of, of Long Island that people would note that this huge prairie was was sitting in the middle of the island even though there weren't some as much people but any traveler that came through would, would make note of it yeah well as the um long island became more and more developed people saw this prairie here and um the the biologically oriented uh, researchers were interested in in trying to understand um, what the prairie was like since they're so unusual in this part of the country. So there was some research done. There were several um, research papers on, on plant lists and plant lists that were made in the early 1900s, and we used those to help us understand what was native and what was not. Is there any sense or records of how the, the Native Americans used this, this part, the, the, the peoples that would have been here? We don't really have much research data on the Native Americans. We think that they most likely did not live on the prairie. Probably they lived down closer to the water, but they came up here to hunt. Um, and we don't really don't have any records, many, many records that we know of, of the Native Americans that lived here. Um, we have some information on how they use some of the plants. For example, they used um, a plant called Indian hemp in order to make their ropes and their, um, their lines and their fishing lines and things like that and they use the wild indigo for dyes and i'm sure they use some of the other plants for dyes as well okay. i want to try another visualization and so i i think we're facing north so in terms i know we've mentioned numbers but in terms of the extent of the the original prairie or at, at its greatest ex extent could you give us some place names people might know heading from like the queen's border east and how far north and south would would this stretch yeah, well, they say that the prairie actually uh, extended from the Queens border all the way over to the Suffolk border, and probably from about Old Country Road on the north to Southern State Parkway in the south. And some of the village names, like East Meadow and Plain View and Plain Edge, and even Garden City, are indicative of how people saw this this uh, habitat when they built their little towns. And, and it's interesting. I, I usually do some research before I come out to these things. So even even like in the early 1900s, people were starting to mention that the, the planes were disappearing. So it's sort of been noted or marked that, you know, hey, there's less of it, less of it. And then we'll talk about Mitchell Field and Roosevelt Field and Vanderbilt Parkway as the as urbanization came further east. How, how close did we come to losing all of these native swaths of the planes? Well, I think this, if, if it weren't for 
um, the county executive in the 1988 who actually preserved this piece and the part across the street that we call the Fran Purcell Preserve, um, we would have lost all of it because this piece in particular is on the campus of Nassau Community College and I'm, I'm sure that it would have been developed into athletic fields or parking lots or some other use by the college if it wasn't saved. But um, they were the college was very cooperative when we formed the um, nonprofit organization Friends of Hempstead Plains, and they, from then on, they've been very cooperative in um, our working here to protect the land, which is really nice. Now we're looking again. We're still looking over the the, the prairie here. So there's a few um, trees that are that are about what ten feet tall. So are those those would be native too? They just would happen to sprout up. There's a variety of trees here. Some of them are native. There's some native oak trees, some native maple trees, um, and, and many of the shrubs that you see that are five or six feet tall, they are invasive shrubs that have to be eliminated. Um, some of the evergreen trees that you see are native red cedar, and we'll keep some of those. Um, some of them also have to be taken out because they're very aggressive. Uh, but basically, this is supposed to be a grassland, and so the original in the original um, history of, of the grassland, there they did talk about some oak trees and some other trees that um, grew up in the prairie, and there was a, even an area in the middle of the prairie called island trees, which from which we got the name of island trees that we have today. To your mind, what's the I don't know if you, you would rank them this way, but what's the worst invasive species that you've encountered? We have three here that are really bad. One of them is called mugwort. Another one is called Chinese bush clover, which obviously invaded in from China. And the third one is called cypress spurge. And they seem to be the, the worst ones um, that we have to try and control. There are also probably several species of lawn grasses that have invaded in here, um, but they don't seem to be so much of a problem as those other three species. We also, as I said before, we also take account every single year of the number of plants because that helps us to understand um, the survival rate and the um, growth rate of the, of the plant. This year we had one of our highest counts. We had 3,701 plants. Uh, that we counted. Last year it was only down around 1,500. Uh, the year before it was around 2,000. And I have to um, say that when we first started counting back in the 1980s, we were getting 400, 500 plants a year. So it certainly has increased over time. So it, as, as a, someone as involved with nature as you are, what, what's your second favorite geological feature of Long Island, if, if we say this plains is your first? Well, I think my, my favorite habitat on Long Island are the salt marshes, which is kind of where I started. And, and we were able to take students to, to the salt marsh. The college had a boat, so we could actually um, wind around the salt marshes down on the South Shore. And uh, that was a fascinating study. Um, the prairie is kind of like my second favorite, mainly because it's located here. Um, but um, all the habitat Habitats are interesting for what they provide and what they have to offer. Is, is it surprising the, the variety or is it, and again, not being a naturalist, if this is a naive question you tell me, but does, does Long Island have a particularly unique diversity of these kind of micro systems? Yeah, Long Island actually has a wide variety of habitats from the forests on the North Shore to the Pine Barrens out east to the salt marshes and the beaches on the South Shore, um, even our prairie here in the middle of Nassau County. We have a great variety of, of habitats. Uh, there are some cranberry bogs out east that are very interesting. So um, it's a great place to do, a, do different kinds of botanical studies. And, and it seems... Um Things have taken a turn for it over the last, not just recently, but over the last couple of maybe decades. The, the awareness of the preservation, the ecological and you know, nature conservancy and Peconic Land Trust. So it, it seems like the tide has turned a little or people who, who have the power to affect it have uh, recognized the value of, of preserving all these unique systems while we still have some left. Yes, that, I think that's a very important aspect of living on Long Island right now, especially because we are so overpopulated that we realize that we really need these native habitats. Um, they're going to save us in the future in terms of food production and habitats for wildlife. Um, our pollinators are so important to us so that these native habitats are, are really, really um, important. 
So I, I came out here from the South Shore, Sayville and, and Suffolk. Is it crazy to think some some types of these plants are in my backyard because they look familiar, but I'm not uh, yes, savvy well, enough to know. Poison ivy because there's okay. just tiny, there's a tiny patch of poison ivy right here where we're walking, okay. uh, which is not common here on the prairie, but unfortunately is right in this area. But um, uh, yeah, yeah, tell so me so that. would 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 the the plants we're seeing here that were in, indigenous or native to the plains also show up like potentially someone some of these could be growing in someone's backyard not saying that that's part of the prairie but these uh, these yeah. native plants could be other places on the island a absolutely people tell me all the time that they have uh, the same native grasses growing in their backyards and they have the 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 golden rods and sometimes the this white bone set and they have they also they talk about their milkweeds they talk about wanting to build their own native gardens so that they can increase the the native populations of, of some of the plants Th that is that is a trend right to replace sort of the manicured lawn with um, indigenous plants, maybe more sustainable varieties. Yes, and, and I'm happy to hear that. It's not so much in Nassau County because people still value their manica manicured lawns, but we're hoping to start to change that. Here's a cute, this is, this is a cute little wildflower right here called butter and eggs. Ah, okay. Which is um, also a prairie plant. Looks like a fried egg, doesn't it? It does, yeah. <laughs> Do you, I guess uh, this far west, maybe not, but do you get any deer in here? We have not seen any deer in here. We've seen fox. Um, unfortunately, uh, people used to walk their dogs in here. We try to discourage that, but um, it looks as though some people may still be walking their dogs. And we also have a problem with feral cats mm -hmm. that wander around in here. And so we have to you know, try and eliminate those things because we want our rabbits and our other small mammals to survive. What's your favorite time of day to be out here? Oh, I think it's in the early evening um, because then as the sun sets and you get the uh, bright colors of the sun setting, you get a beautiful um, hue of, of colors across the prairie. And uh, it's, uh, you know, not many people come out at that time of day, but it's really lovely then. Let's start talking about the history of it and uh, maybe if you've seen old maps and things like that. So we're, I guess this section, there, I, I'm just wondering people how to traverse this plains right so some there were they, I know they did a lot of cattle raising or, or you know grazing of, of livestock um, was were the plains pretty much well intersected with with roads and you know ways for people to get north south east west that's what we think there's actually one road that we just um, passed by um, that crosses over I guess it would be north to south across the uh, prairie that we can see on our property here that used to be an old wagon trail. And um, if you look at the old maps, it goes all the way down to Hempstead Turnpike and probably continues further north as well. And, you know, some of the things that interest me, I, I know some of the early earliest uses, you know, think of anything that you need a broad, flat space to do. So horse racing, I think, was one of the first mentions that, that you hear about in the in the colonial times. Do you, do you know much about the, the history of horse racing on the plains? Well, they say that the first horse race on Long Island was held here at the plains, probably up in the Roosevelt Field area um, but in the 1600s. And I guess um, it, it continued there for a while until it moved over to Belmont. And then um, people may have heard of the history of, of uh, military camps, you know, Mexican-American War, Spanish-American War. So there was a lot of, I know camp, the story of Camp Upton more, which is in Yapank, but the same type of thing was going on here. Huge, huge gatherings of men getting ready to be shipped out somewhere. Yes, uh, the Hempstead Plains was the site of the military camps for all the early wars, um, all the way up to the Second World War. And are those sections now buried I guess that's under the mall and, and other places so like like th that didn't touch your section here right that those camps were well they may have um obviously the Hempstead Plains was much larger um back then but uh, Mitchell Field was uh, you know an important air base and that would, was 2,000 acres of, of the land that we're standing on right now Right, which speaks to the whole the, the aviation industry growing up in the early 1900s. And again, you needed large flat spaces for runways and air shows and all that. And that, that you know, the, that's why it's called the creative of aviation. So, so now we're on your back porch here on the deck. 
uh, this is a nice little deck area that we have on the northwest side of the building that faces out to the rest of our 17 acres. So we get a nice view um, all across the Pemstead Plains. And what, just give us some of the basics, like when, when are you open to the public? Are there certain hours or things to be aware of? Right now, we're, we're a little bit short of staff. So we're open Fridays and Saturdays and sometimes uh, Thursdays and Sundays. It kind of depends on when the staff member is available to come. And then another thing that's really important to us is um, trying to raise money for the various activities that we do since we're a nonprofit organization. So we try to have fundraisers at different times of year, and, and we've been having a, an annual dinner co- cocktail party, um, which had to be uh, canceled due to COVID, but we're hoping that that can get started up again. And um, you know, people can come and see what we're all about and enjoy some wine and, and uh, hors d'oeuvres. And, and we have a, a humongous raffle. Uh, table that um, is, seems to be very attractive to people. So uh, things like that. And I, if you want to say more, I think you, you um, recently published a book to the Friends. Yes, uh, we recently published a book of, uh, called The Natural and Human History of the Hempstead Plains. It's edited by one of our board members, Dr. Paul Van Wy, um, who is the president of the Franklin Square Historical Society. Uh, we gathered together a series of articles about the natural history as well as the human history, development and so forth of, of the Hempstead Plains. There's something like 11 or 12 different articles that are all compiled together in this one book and it's been very popular people have been ordering it right and left you can order it on paypal on our website which is www.friendsofhp.org so just out of curiosity from all the things you've read or seen or heard what's one of the more strange or unique events that happened on the Hempstead Plains that, that you've come across well One of the things that I find most fascinating is that in the 1800s, when it was owned by the town of Hempstead, and it was just pretty much open space, the town of Hempstead held it in in commons for the farmers to graze their sheep. And the farmers would just let their sheep go for the summer months, and in the fall they would have to collect them all together again. And so they held what they called a um, sheep parting day, which was a special event on one day, usually in October, when uh, the farmers would all come out and they would separate and gather up all their sheep so they could take them back to their own farms for the winter. And part of the festivities included music and dancing and food and games and um, magic tricks and all sorts of uh, fun things for the people to do on that day. And it it was also a big political gathering for all the um, politicians who were running that year would come out and give their speeches as well. As as a big picture takeaway, you've mentioned, I think, the endangered count has been up. How would you rate the health of your section of the Plains as it stands today? I think we are the best example of a tall grass prairie that we have right now, and uh, certainly in this part of the country. Um, It's not perfect. We still have an abundance of non-native plants, um, probably less than 50% coverage, but we have a good, uh, healthy crop of the native grasses, um, six or seven species of native grasses here, and many, many, many wildflowers that um, continue to grow. And we know that in the seed bank, there are still lots of seeds of the you know historical plants that used to grow here. Another straight thought, but as as we're looking out here, you know, it's it's not literally flat. So it's striking me that not only is is the grassland preserved, the vegetation, but the the actual topography of this section is is what you know is, is never been flattened or raised or built on. So you you get the sense of early days Long Island, how how the landscape might have rolled away from you, and and how the contours of the land might have been. Yeah, that's true. Um, even when you know we we think of a prairie as being a flat grassland, but really when you look at what we have here, there are hills and and valleys and and um, you know changes in. Um, altitude at least by 10 feet 
And so there are areas that were closer to the water table and areas that were further from the water table. And it just goes to show that the prairie wasn't completely flat. In fact, at the beginning, and when it was 40,000 acres, there were several streams that ran through the prairie. When you think about Valley Stream and um, Mill Stream and Meadowbrook, the stream that runs by the Meadowbrook Parkway and the, the system that runs by Wontaw Parkway and the Massapequa Preserve Stream. There were all these little streams that ran right through the Hempstead Plains down to the bay. And so the, the topography of the land was elevated between the streams and then it dipped down into the uh, you know, little riparian habitat at the edge of the streams. No, a lot to think about, and, and again, it's great that this is here and that you're preserving it, so we want to thank you for that. We want to thank you for spending time with us today. Any, any final thoughts, anything we haven't asked you or anything you want to mention before we sign off? Well, it was my pleasure. I always love talking about the Hempstead Plains, and um, if people want more information or are interested in visiting, um, you can check our website. Again, it's www.friendsofhp.org. Um, we also have a Facebook page, uh, Facebook Friends of Hempstead Plains, and um, get some information and some phone numbers there that um, you can reach us by. And there we go. Thanks again to Betsy for guiding us through the history of the Hempstead Plains. You'll find links to their organization and more information in our show notes at longislandhistoryproject.org. If you have any suggestions for people we should talk to, or if you have your own story to tell connected to Long Island history, drop us a line. We're at longislandhistoryproject at gmail.com. And if you're enjoying the podcast, if you are learning anything new or revisiting things you've learned in the past, All we ask is that you share it with a friend, share the link, recommend it, help us spread the word that there is a podcast out there dedicated to Long Island history. Our outro music is Capering by the Blue Dot Sessions, used under an Attribution 4.0 international license. That does it for this episode. As always, thank you for listening.